Ladies and gentlemen, it's Saturday, it's Scotland, it's 1pm, and it is a force for goods, Saturday, street stall, coming to you live from our nerve centre here in the great British city of Glasgow, with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And we've just got a little bit of good British rock and roll in the background there for Saturday. Now, we've got a lot to talk about today. And what we're going to put our theme around is the constitutional position of the lockdown. Now, we're not going to get into the rights and wrongs, technically or medically, of the lockdown. We're simply going to look at the politics of it, as far as unionism is concerned. Because it has had, and it will have, serious consequences for the unity and integrity of the Uni United Kingdom moving forward. Thank you to all those who are giving us a wave here on our Facebook camera and here on our Twitter camera. Thanks very much for this. Now, the constitutional position is something that isn't really being looked at properly by uh, the commentators in the mainstream media. And to the extent that they're looking at it, they're rejoicing in the chaos because the mainstream media loves to create um, uh, politicians against each other, especially the London metropolitan elite who run the British national media, and especially many people up here in Scotland who control the the Scottish newspapers and the Scottish media, and so they are they're loving the um, the conflict between. Boris, who they're trying to portray as the English Prime Minister, not the British Prime Minister, and Nicola Sturgeon, who they're trying to build up as the new President of Scotland. And this, that's a serious matter for us as Unionists, if that narrative, if that story continues on. Goodness me, where's that going to end? There is only one end to that. So... The big news is, of course, that Scotland is staying home for the foreseeable future. And I'm not talking about the World Cup final. I'm talking about, of course, the COVID lockdown. So we're going to see in the next a few minutes, we're going to examine how did we get here in the first place? And then we're going to look at the constitutional politics of it. And then we're going to finish by talking about what can be done moving forward from a unionist perspective. And as I say, we're not going to talk about the rights and wrongs of the lockdown, which I'm sure we have all got our own personal opinions on. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the constitutional politics of this. And I'm going to be speaking about Boris here, but if you're a Boris fan, please don't take it personally. I'm really only speaking about Boris in his capacity as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and in his capacity as the Prime Minister of Scotland. We have to remember Boris is the Prime Minister of Scotland. He is the foremost political authority in Scotland and he needs to act like that. He needs to to embrace being Prime Minister of Scotland, realise that is actually a more important position than the First Minister of Scotland, which is a devolved position with courtesy of the British Parliament. So you see, the First Minister of Scotland is, is a creation of the British Parliament, is essentially a creation of the British government and the British Prime Minister. And so that hierarchical it must be said relationship has to has has to be first and foremost otherwise the Met london metropolitan elite and the scottish media are going to 
try to pretend that they're both the same in order to create divergence, in order to create the breakup of Britain. And, you know, here's something that we all have to remember. The London metropolitan elite have skin in this game. They have a dog in this fight, OK? They don't like Boris. They don't like Brexit. And they want their revenge on him. And if breaking up the United Kingdom is the price that they'll pay to get their revenge for losing the Brexit battle, then that's what they will do. So when you're reading a lot of this stuff that's coming out of London, when you're watching the stuff that the, the media that's coming out of London, and when also you are reading or watching a lot of the Scottish media, remember, these people have an agenda to get back at Boris because they have still not forgiven the British people for 2016 for that vote. They have not forgiven and nor will they forgive. So they have they they want their revenge. And if talking about four nations in order to break up the United Kingdom into four separate squabbling nations is the consequence, then as far as they're concerned, that's good. That's value for money. They've got their way. So remember, when you see people attacking the prime minister, remember, they're doing it deliberately because they don't like him and they don't like Brexit. Brexit's at the root of a lot of this, as is, of course, the flawed, flawed devolutionary so-called settlement, which we'll be getting to. So how did we get to where we are today, right now, where you can play a game of golf in England, but you can't play a game of golf in Scotland? Isn't that ridiculous? Can you think of a more socially distanced sport than golf, where you're literally walking about an empty acre of grass? Um, but that's not allowed in Scotland. Well, I can absolutely guarantee you that that would be allowed in Scotland if England had shut down the golf courses in the next few weeks. Because the Scottish First Minister, as we know, does everything in reverse from England. Anyway, how did we get here? Metaphysically and legally, basically. Here is a truth of life that I am about to convey to you. Reality that we live in is created by the words which come out of politicians' mouths. That's a fact of life. It's how reality is created. So if you have political leadership that's optimistic, that's talking up the country, that is um, giving everybody heart and hope, then you will have an optimistic, heartful people. If you have a leader who's constantly angry, who's constantly pointing the fingers at other people, who's constantly being pessimistic, then you will have a pessimistic, angry country. That's the way life works. If you talk up a deep shelter mentality, which is what our politicians, and indeed most of the politicians of the world actually, lately have been speaking up, then you will create a population with a deep shelter mentality, you will create a fearful population. If you have a politician who promotes a keep calm and carry on message, then you will have a population that keeps calm and carries on. That's the truth as night follows day. That's the way it works. And we spoke about this deep shelter mentality and the dangers of it last week. When we gave the example of the bomb shelter in Ramsgate during World War II, where hundreds of people were sheltering in, to the point where the British government forcibly evicted them because they were lowering morale for the surrounding area. And that was back when we had a keep calm and carry on approach to life. Today, we have politicians who are promoting a deep shelter mentality, which essentially is one of fear. And so you end up after two months, after two months of this message, we end up where we are today, which is political reality revolves around this fear. And so the, the, the SNP now, and indeed the mayor of Liverpool or the Welsh first minister or whatever, they see a political advantage in maintaining this fear. And you only have to read the national newspaper, which I do every day. And I read the national newspaper so that you don't have to. I always say that because at least one unionist has to read it to know what these people are thinking. And believe me, the letters pages are full of people who have lost their mind, who think that the 
British government is some sort of murderous regime who wants to basically kill us all and put us in a situation where we're all going to lose our lives. And I cut out all these letters and I was going to go through them, but I'm just not going to subject you to the absolute nonsense that these people come out with. And this is a consequence of the, the politics of the deep shelter mentality, where now you get advantage over another person by fear, by promoting fear. And so the political debate descends into, should we deep shelter at this level or at this level? Whereas if we had had to keep calm and carry on mentality, it would be, do we keep ca carrying on and keeping calm at this level or do we keep carrying on at an even better level? So, as I say, pol reality, how we move and have our being is created by the, polit the words that come out of politicians' mouths. So that's the metaphysical interpretation of why we are t at where we are today and why... Um, we have a political debate which revolves entirely around fear instead of around keeping calm and carrying on. And we say that regardless of what you may think the risks of this virus may be, um, whether they are serious, not, or otherwise. Um, so we have a political situation which is continuing to look for the worst in everything. And people are... SNP or Welsh First Minister or Liverpool Mayor or whoever, they think that they can get some political advantage by playing on fear. And that's a very bad and sad place that we've ended up in, quite frankly. But it is where we are. It is where we are. And it's a perfect consequence of the words which have come out of politicians' mouths for the last two months. So it's no surprise that this is our reality that we are within so that's a metaphysical interpretation. What is a legal interpretation? Well, the legal interpretation, the legal interpretation is that, um, the legal interpretation is the Coronavirus Act 2020, which was passed in Parliament. And I've been studying it and I've printed out stuff here so I can just actually be clear about it. And this was an act of the British Parliament and it was applicable to all of the United Kingdom. There were aspects of it which applied to England, applied to Wales, applied to Northern Ireland, applied to Scotland or applied to separate areas in and of themselves. And the big takeaway from the Coronavirus Act 2020 is for us here in Scotland is Schedule 22, Part 3, which is all about powers relating to events, gatherings and premises in Scotland. And what this did legally is it gave the power to, quote unquote, the Scottish ministers of Holyrood to make the decisions. So it was an act of the British Parliament which gave the power to Holyrood to make the decisions related to powers about events and gatherings and premises and so on and so forth in Scotland. Now, on the face of it, that was a very, very risky move because what did they expect was going to happen as a consequence of that? Did they honestly think that they were going to be able to get the uh, t to move as one. Now, don't get me wrong, there is obviously a case for different approaches in different areas of the country. For example, Lerick up in the north of Scotland probably is not at risk to the extent that people in London are going to be at risk. Some areas of Scotland which are just mountains with a few villages are not going to be as at risk as B Birmingham or Glasgow or wherever. So there is, uh, there is a uh, sense in having an ability to uh, have different policies in different areas of the country. However, it's who you give that power to that is the problem. And if you're giving that power to 
into the hands of a party that's been working for 13 years to break up the United Kingdom, then how do you think that power is going to end up? How do you think that's going to go? Of course, it's not going to go to some kind of unified advantage. So when you're a politician, you have to think about these things. You have to think, this is a massive power that could backfire against me. How do I keep control of it? OK, it's not about let's give it to Nicola Sturgeon to show how generous we are. No, it's we've got to keep the United Kingdom together. We have a, a revolutionary party up there who are trying to destroy the British state. Do we really... Do we really want to give them all these powers? Not really. No, you don't want to. You want to find a way of maintaining a one nation approach, not a four nation approach. You see, there's even in the British political lexicon, there is a concept known as one nation conservatism. OK, so the Conservative Party of all parties have a concept of one nation. So they need to live by that and they need to be the unionists that they claim. And you're not going to be unionist minded if you give serious powers over the control of people to a party that is only going to use them against you. You know, it's very simple. It's very simple. You don't need to hear it from a force for good, but it seems that sometimes the, the British government actually does need to know that. So what just very briefly, what should they have done? Well, emergency powers is still a reserved matter in the Scotland Act 1998. Emergency powers, however you may define those powers, is a reserved matter. Now, the Prime Minister of Scotland, who is Boris Johnston, who is also the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Wales and England and the United Kingdom together should have made it clear that under the, the devolved legislation, he has the power to, to write anything into emergency legislation. So he should have put in a wee note there, perhaps in the Coronavirus Act, that, or indeed he should have actually not even gone that way, but what, what he should have done essentially is say, look, emergency powers are a British competency. If ever we need a British-wide approach, a one-nation approach. It is a time of British national emergency. That would have been stated up front. He would have put his secretaries of state for Northern Ireland and Wales and Scotland up front as the public face of the British parliamentary response. And the, it would be the secretary of state who would have the power to decide what was happening. And the Secretary of State would work in close cooperation, of course, with the devolved assemblies. But there would have been no doubt that at the end of the day, it was the Secretary of State and the British Parliament that was center stage, because I'm gonna to get to this, I'm gonna to get to the, 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 the importance of simply keeping up appearances in a moment. So it would have been seen Britain and the British Parliament and the Secretaries of State, the center stage, they're the people who are uh, who we are looking to for guidance. And then immediately, of course, there would have been an attempt to standardise all measurements of, of deaths. Rather than having Scotland recording COVID deaths in a different way from England, which is utter madness, that would never have happened pre-devolution. What you would have had pre-devolution is a standardised measure from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England to the far west of Northern Ireland, you would have had a standardised measure of death. So you would have been able to see there's no deaths up in that area of the country. There's a few deaths over there and there's a lot concentrated in this area. And then the, the, the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State would have worked with the devolved parliaments to say, right, we're all going to open up these areas and these areas can stay in for another week or two. But the point is, it would have been a centralised approach with centralised statistics. And do you know what? If, if this had happened pre-1999, that would immediately have happened. That would immediately have happened. And there is no doubt that it would have been done quickly and it would have done, it'd been done accurately and it would have been done effectively and it would have had a very short chain of command and everybody would know where they stood. 
And we would all be like, fantastic. We've got people in charge who know what's going on. I can rest easy. We know somebody's on the ball here. But what we've seen, of course, under devolution is the failings of devolution. Um, it was it was naive to think that the hostile administrations who opposed the Tory government were in any way going to go along. If you gave them the power under that act, if you gave them the power, they were going to use it against you. And that was just basic. And if we've learned anything, I do hope, I do hope that, um, I do hope that that's something that we've learned and uh, that to me, that, uh, that that that's taken note of. Devolution is leading to political point scoring and a four nations approach rather than a one nations approach is inevitably going to mean four different solutions, four different answers and four to the point of 100 multiplied different opinions on things. It's just going to be chaos. So when it's a national, British national emergency, we need a British national solution. And that's what we had pre-1999. And that's what we would need again if this was ever to happen. And that is surely a lesson that can come out of that. But will our politicians learn? That's the thing. Will our politicians learn? Do they even know or do they even understand these things? Well, so much for what should have been done or what could have been done. What about going forward here? Now, some people will say, oh, just give Nicola Sturgeon the power. Oh, just give her it because let her carry the can because she'll foul up and then we'll all see what mess she's made of it and then we'll all vote against her. So much wrong with that. So much wrong with that. One, that's not the way politics works. But more importantly, that's a that's an unhealthy way of looking at politics. The healthy way of looking at politics is if you give somebody the power, they're going to do a reasonable job or as best they can with that job, while at the same time promoting their own political point of view which may be entirely opposite to yours. So if you give people power, you have to reasonably assume they're going to use it as best as they can, even if you disagree with them. You have to presume that. You don't give people power and think, oh, just wait till he fouls up on this and then we'll be the heroes. That's a sick way of looking at politics. And it just keeps you perpetually frustrated and perpetually angry. So... The answer is don't give her the power in the first place. That's the answer. Don't give her the power so that she, so that she fouls up. Just don't give her the power because she's going to take it and then she's going to use it to put herself centre stage. And this is what it's all about. Being the centre. If you're a politician, being the centre stage, taking the limelight, taking the limelight over the person that gave you that power so that so he becomes yesterday's man and then you're now the new person that people are looking at. That's what politics is about. So we know if we give Sturgeon the power, she's just going to jump onto centre stage with it and she may make mistakes. But here's the thing. If you have authority, people will allow you to make mistakes. That's another secret of politics. If you have authority and you maintain that authority, people will allow you to make mistakes and they'll make excuses when you make mistakes. And you'll convince a lot of people and of course a lot of people will not be convinced, but provided you maintain your authority, that's what's important. You must not lose your authority because when you lose your authority as a politician, as Boris Johnson has risked doing in Scotland, when you lose that authority, it's very difficult to get it back very difficult. You can do it, but it's difficult and it's needless. You should not have lost your authority in the first place. And you should certainly not have openly given it to Nicola Sturgeon via this act, because you were going to lose your authority from what's written here. There's no question about that. So, so she's got the authority now in Scotland and it's about Boris getting that authority back. 
<clears throat> and about ensuring that he does not intentionally or unintentionally marginalise himself in the future. It's about reasserting himself in the public mind of the people of Scotland and, of course, also Wales and Northern Ireland. Can he reassert his all-important authority? And as again, I'm, as I say, I'm not talking about Boris per se. I'm talking about the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Can the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom reassert his authority and his place once again as the top legislator? as the top politician in Scotland. That is now his job and he has to get on that. He has to get on that. And I'm not wanting to be critical too much of Boris. I know that the poor man has been ill. I know that he's got a new baby, which must take up his time. Maybe that even stops him sleeping at night. Goodness me. So personally, he's been under the weather. So I'm giving him some leeway there and I'm not criticising him as such as a man because I don't want to, to do that. I also remember that he is assaulted daily by the vile mainstream media who try to portray him as, uh, you know, in the very worst terms. And that must take a psychological blow on you as well. But if you're the leader of the country, you should that should just, you know, wash over you. You shouldn't be too bothered about that. But they do want to punish him. The mainstream media in London and in Scotland want to punish him for Brexit. Um, and that's why they love this four nations approach. And the mainstream media does not care the, if Britain breaks up. That's the thing. It does not care, unfortunately. So in, as far as that's concerned... We have to be aware of that matter. Um, I'm talking generally, of course. I'm talking generally, of course. However, let me give him some good advice here. One, Mr Johnston, please understand that you do have support in Scotland in your capacity as Scotland's Prime Minister. In your capacity as the most important politician in Scotland... In the, and in the United Kingdom, you do have support and you do have latent support. And there's a lot of people out there who are just waiting for somebody to come up and to um, stand up for Scotland. Because, you know, we're unionists up here. Don't don't throw us under the bus. Don't for, remember, there's a massive majority of people who want the United Kingdom to stay together throughout the UK. And in Scotland, it's still a majority so we need somebody to speak for us and to speak strongly for us and to speak strongly for the United Kingdom. So you have support and you have latent support to stand up and assert your authority. This is what it's all about, authority. Assert your authority in your uh, way that you do best as the Prime Minister of Scotland. We're wanting you and we're waiting for you to do that. And we need you to do that because we need... This, we are unionists and we need somebody to stand up for unionism and against the Scottish nationalists. So start to think of yourself, not just um, as... Think of yourself specifically as Scotland's prime minister, OK? And, and, and have the courage to stand for that. Um, ensure a one-nation approach to all of these things, not a four-nations approach. Now, the media and no doubt some of your advisors who don't really understand the United Kingdom will tell you to try a four-nations approach. A four-nations approach will end up with four different answers, OK? So you're a conservative, you do your one-nation conservatism thing, OK? And the one nation is the United Kingdom. Do not fall into the trap of federalism because we're, we're seeing some articles about commentators going oh britain is now obviously broken the only way is to have four different countries in a federal system well that will just be what we've got at the moment times a hundred it would be much worse no the answer is to maintain the integrity of the united kingdom um to maintain our unitary state not to break away and give the Scottish nationalists even more power. So do not fall for the federalist trap. Federalism is a stepping stone to separation. It only works where everyone wants it to work. 
But when you have people in Scotland and a powerful party in Scotland who don't want it to work, then it will lead to a separation in short time. It will lead to separation in short time. And just start coming up to Scotland a lot more, you know, and do it openly and publicly. And don't don't come up and talk to a small group of Tories in an empty aircraft hangar in the middle of nowhere, OK? Don't come up and talk to the mainstream media, OK, uh, who are in Scotland, who are only going to try to make you look like a fool. Don't go on to any of their programmes. Come up yourself, some colleagues, have a video camera, walk about Scotland, meet people, put it up on YouTube, put it up on the internet, put it up on social media and just cut out this, the mainstream media because the mainstream media can do nothing for you up here, OK? So, but you and your personality and your mobile phone and broadcasting your personality to people that's asserting your authority. And if somebody comes up on the street and gives you a hard time, so be it. So be it. You know, just take them on. Just take them on because you have to be a carnivore, right, in Scotland. You can't be a herbivore. What we have among unionist politicians is what we call the unionist herbivores, OK? Bumping their toothless gums on grass. And they're up against a revolutionary party of 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 people who are wanting to destroy the United Kingdom, okay? You don't you don't mince around with these people, okay? You have to be a carnivore when you're in their presence. You have to put them in your in their place. So ensure ensure that you uh, you know don't be goofy about it. Stand up strongly for the United Kingdom against these people become a unionist carnivore like a force for good and for our thin like our thin red line not a unionist herbivore because they are going to get eaten they are going to get eaten that's the sad truth about unionist herbivores you've got to be a unionist carnivore now i mean we've even invited boris onto our thin red line back in january we sent him a letter inviting him to join us. You know, we've got the platform there. The Scott Nats had a march uh, in Glasgow and we invited Boris to stand on our platform and, and address them, not as a Tory, but in his capacity as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And you know what? We got a nice letter back from him saying, not this time. So maybe you'll, maybe you'll see him. Maybe you'll see him on the thin red line. But if he is on the thin red line, it will be in his capacity as the Prime Minister, not as a Tory. We'll have to say that to him, make that clear to him. Because we are non-party, OK? We are non-party. But we do support any politician who wants to keep the United Kingdom together and wants to grow it into another, um, into a stronger, greater, more integrated country. We support any politician. And we don't care what party you are a member of. If that's your goal, then fine. Good, good. So what can you do now, Boris, to rebuild your authority in Scotland? Well, you know, none of us know what's coming down the line when we all get let out of our houses. But one thing that we can say for sure is that Britain is going to need to be rebuilt in some way in these new circumstances which will present themselves. And that is a great opportunity for an optimistic politician. And that is an opportunity for Boris. And he must lead the rebuilding of all corners of the United Kingdom. He must not give that authority simply to Nicola Sturgeon. If there's any money to be spent it must be very clearly branded as British spending and it must be spent, if necessary, over the heads of Holyrood. OK, because here's a little secret about Holyrood. If you give the SNP money, they will take it without thanks. They will complain that it wasn't enough. They will then bank it and then they'll pretend that they never even received it, okay? You give the SNP money, they take it without thanks, 
They bank it and pretend that they never received it. And that is their modus operandi for everything. You give them lots of new powers. They take them, they bank them, they pretend that they never received them. We always use the example of the so-called vow, where huge, great number of powers which shouldn't have been given to Hollywood were given immediately after the, the 2014 referendum. And um, the SNP to this day pretend that they never got anything. So, you know, they're, they're thankless. Don't give them anything. If there's money to be spent, spend it over their heads and brand it as British. And you have to do that because otherwise billions are going to get spent in Scotland and the British centre, the British Parliament will receive no thanks for it. And a year or two down the line, people won't even know where it came from. And then a year or so later, people say, we never even got it anyway. Remember that. The SNP will take your money without thanks, bank it and pretend that they never received it. So, have an economic plan. Brand the money as British. Come up here a lot and show us your personality. Show us that you care about Scotland. And um, don't let the SNP set the economic agenda. You know, Nicola Sturgeon is talking about locking us back down again if there was a second wave of this virus. Well, what business person is going to reopen their cafe or try to start up their business again or try to rehire and retrain people if a week or two down the line it's all going to get closed down again? You can't. You cannot run an economy like that. If it reopens, it has to reopen for good. And it has to reopen with a new keep calm and carry on message, not a deep shelter message, which only breeds paralyzing fear. OK, <clears throat> and finally, I would say to Boris Johnston, you know, it's not enough to say you believe in the United Kingdom. It's not enough to say you're a one nation conservative. You have to do it's not enough to say, you have to do, okay? Unity has to be created, it has to be encouraged, it has to be brought alive by our efforts. Because otherwise it will just fall apart. And you know, the great Neil Oliver has put this so well, so well. The union has been the work of centuries taken on and completed by countless selfless people, statesmen, soldiers, common citizens. It has been here so long it can be easy to think it just happened. A work of nature like a mountain or an ancient tree. The truth is it was ever a fragile thing. Union is a dream shared by a people and kept real only by their imagination and conviction, and if we neglect to maintain it, the temple will fall. All of it will be destroyed, and so the work of centuries will be undone. That's what we're about here. That's what is at stake. And so it's not enough to say you're a unionist, and then put something like the Coronavirus Act 2020 into law, where you give all the powers to mess up society to the SNP. That's not good enough, OK? And I'm not criticising you, Boris, because I know you're a good chap and I know you've got a good heart, OK? Uh, I'm just trying to give you some constructive advice here because you and I are on the same page as far as maintaining the union is concerned. And I know that, uh, that uh, you can do this, OK? You can do this. And when you, you Boris, were first uh, elected as the leader of the Tories. We sent you an open letter. And we, uh, and when you first came to, to Scotland as well, and we gave you five pieces of advice, five pieces of advice, which are worth uh, saying again. Do not be bothered by the SNP or those who say that you're English or that you're blonde hair and blue eyed or that you're an Etonian or whatever. Don't be thinking that you as that can't represent Scotland, OK, because we don't care who you are or where you went to school or anything like that. If you're a good unionist, we will support you here in Scotland. So don't be put off by the Anglophobia 
that the Scottish National Party will try to cultivate against you subtly, subtly in the media. Do not fall for the SNP's claim that it represents Scotland. The SNP does not speak for Scotland any more than any other part, political party claims so to do. At the most, it speaks for those who voted for it. And in many cases, it doesn't even speak for its own members on matters like Brexit, for example. Don't be intimidated by the SNP's claim to be Scotland's government. Remember, you're Scotland's prime minister. You got to remember that Nicola Sturgeon is uh, a creation of the British Parliament, okay? And if you can get rid of this talk about two governments, get rid of it, because that's that's not unionist talk, okay? Okay, the, the Scottish uh, SNP does not represent a government, it represents a devolved administration. That's how it has to be portrayed, it's a devolved administration. Uh, the reality is that Scotland has one government, and that is the British government, because we're still part of the United Kingdom, and long may that continue. And there cannot be stability until that relationship is understood. It's a, a vertical hierarchical relationship. It's not a horizontal relationship between two equals. And don't be, don't be encouraged by those who say that you should give the SNP more power and those who are trying to promote a federalist agenda because that will just make matters worse and that will fall into the hands of your enemies who want to hurt you and who want to break up Britain in revenge for Brexit. And if you need any more advice, Boris, please contact aforceforgood.uk. We've got all the stuff up there on our site. And I think that's probably all I want to say, really, about Boris and the coronavirus issue and the constitutional politics of this matter. And... It's um, it's it's a very serious, very serious issue, and we'll have a lot more to say on it as we go forward. But for the moment, it's all about maintaining one nation. It's about you, Boris, maintaining your authority, okay? Not ceding your authority, because once you cede your authority as a politician, it's very hard to get it back. So here in Scotland, you have to get up here. Just avoid the mainstream media who will only be out to hurt you, but just come up. Uh, do some videos on your mobile phone, have a drink in a pub, get into an argument, whatever. Show us your human side. Show us that you are asserting yourself as a unionist here in our great British Union. And come up and get the pubs open as well and we'll take you out for a drink. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. That would put you on the front pages anyway. So, ladies and gentlemen, send in your questions. Thanks for waving at us. Send in your questions and your comments, and we'd love to hear what you think as well. As I say, we're not knocking Boris. We're, 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 we're perfectly, we perfectly understand the difficult political situation that he's in. We're just giving him some advice here on what he needs to do in order to reassert his authority. And when you've got authority, you can make mistakes and people will excuse you for it. So that's why giving Sturgeon the power is, is, uh, is, is dangerous. Because when she makes mistakes, lots of people will make excuses for her. That's just normal. That's just the way politics works. That's just the way politics works. And um, <clears throat> we call this our Saturday street stall. Because normally on a Saturday, we would be out on the streets of our great British city, of Glasgow or indeed in any of of the other great British towns around Scotland and around the um, central belt or wherever and we can't do that at the moment so the next best thing is to put our message across to you through the wonders of modern technology on our Facebook camera and on our Twitter and if you can share what we've been saying here please give that share button a click if you can retweet it please retweet it please retweet it with a comment because if you retweet it with a comment, we can then retweet that tweet to 26,000 people. Okay, so that's a way of getting your point of view out to 26,000 people. If you get 50 followers, retweet us with a comment and we'll retweet you to 26,000 people, okay? Um, also, please... 
please go to forceforgood.uk forward slash support and put in your name and your email and you will be um, added automatically to our email update because we're trying to build our list of email updates and email uh, supporters so that we have another alternative way of communicating to you if if that um, and we do that every fortnight okay we send out an email update showing you all the articles we've written all the videos we've done and we have a fantastic video editor now every week we're putting out four or five videos and I want to say thank you to our video editor I want to thank say thank you to our Instagram curator we're now the biggest Instagram page uh, for unionism British unionism in the world and nobody's going to catch up on us really we have, have got 26,000 followers on Twitter that's amazing reach amazing reach so please retweet this get that out there and we're not stopping on Twitter by the way we're adding hundreds a month and we have to do this because next year is the critical 2021 where Nicola Sturgeon is going to be going to the people and she's going to be saying, vote for us and we'll get rid of these nasty English. And that will be, you know, people people could vote for that. You know, don't get us wrong. She could vote for that. And then she'll say, we won. We need a referendum. And that's something we don't want to happen. So we have to ensure that this SNP and the, the Scottish Cabbage Party, otherwise known as the Soggy Greens, we have to ensure that they do not get a majority. We have to ensure that. We have to ensure that they're not able to bring forward a second referendum, which they will do. They will do even if the country has fallen apart, even if the economy hasn't even got off the ground yet. They will do that because that's what they are. They are a revolutionary party intended to destroy the British state and they don't have any cares about when they will do something like this. OK, they don't care either way. So if they if them and the Scottish Cabbage Party were to get uh, a majority, then there would be a second referendum. No question about it. And um, so we have to ensure that does not happen. And if the Tories and Labour can up their game, then we can ensure that does not happen. And I tell you something else that's happening that I've just been noticing as well in in uh, in the last week is that po opinions are polarizing and there's a lot of people now in Scotland but more unionists are just saying look get rid of Hollywood scrap it scrap it there's a party in Wales called the abolish the Welsh Assembly Party and they got uh, I think a conservative councillor um, moved over to them last week and we put that news out and it got hundreds of shares hundreds of likes and we're like hello hello there's actually a movement now among unionism just to abolish them. We're not saying that's, we're not advocating any political party here or anything. We're just noting what's what's happening out there in 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 the great British Twitter and Facebook uh, galaxies. Um, yeah. So any any points that you've got there? Thanks very much for coming in, all the folk who are watching. Give us a a comment or a point of view. Um, on any of that and <clears throat> how you think yourself things are going to pan out and whether or not you think unionism is um, is going to is going to burst forward again and and I, I do believe that the that we will and I do believe that a force for good is going to be at the front of that because there's so much that's been going unsaid and this coronavirus pandemic uh, the response to it politically has just shown the, the weaknesses of the devolutionary structure. So, um, and some, somebody, uh, as I say, this is a weekly street stall, and somebody has sent in a message there saying, what do you say to people who say, ah, yes, that's related to an article that we wrote last week. Um, one of the things that we, we get who do you think will become the uh, sorry? Who do you think will become the SNP's candidate for Edinburgh Central? Joanne Cherry or Angus Robertson? Probably Joanne Cherry, but either way, it's a it's a nightmare. Either way, it's a nightmare. Also, do this. Do you think the Scottish Cabbage Party will do better or worse than they did in twenty sixteen? I think that they will probably uh, do worse. I see no reason why they should do better. I see no reason why the Scottish Cabbage Party should do any better. It's not like, I mean, a few. 
I mean, they're just they're perpetually pessimistic people, the Scottish Cabbage Party. You know, remember two months ago, we were all going to be dying of climate change. Well, they've forgotten all about the climate change out there. And now we're all going to be dying of COVID, you know. And then in two months time, we're all going to be dying of whatever. Um, so they're just perpetually aggrieved people, the, the Scottish Green Party. And we say to them, you know, you just have to come out of that mentality because we know it very well. Um, and we understand it. It's a kind of secular, secular apocalypticism is what we call it. It's for it, the Scottish Cabbage Party is like a religion for people who don't believe in God, essentially. Um, and they solve the world through moaning about climate change. And if unless we give up our sinful ways, we are all going to die from I don't know what what the consequence of climate change are drowned or, you know, burnt to death by the sun or something like that. In 8,000 years time. So pointless, they're pointless, they're pointless. So they will do less, they will do, they will do, they will not do as well as they uh, have done in the past, which wasn't particularly well anyway. Um, yeah, so somebody said, why can't, what do you say to people who say that, why can't Scotland go it alone? Well, we say very quickly, why can't Scotland work together? with the rest of the United Kingdom. You know, it's all about it's all about rhetoric. Why can't Scotland be independent? Why can't Scotland be working together with the rest of the United Kingdom in harmony for the greater good of us all? Why can't we go it alone? Why can't we stick together? Oh, but don't you know that Scotland has got a, a great economy uh, and we've got great potential? Of course. Of course, we've got great potential. So let's stay within the union, make Scotland successful and share our wealth and redistribute our resources to our family throughout the rest of these islands. What's wrong with that? You always have to turn around and put them on the back foot. And there is an answer to everything that they will say. And we're running a new series at the moment of articles called Debunking Scott Nat Myths. And they've got, uh, we published our fifth article on that last night and you can just go to a forceforgood.uk and uh, you can see that down the side of the web page and we were giving answers to people giving answers to people uh, on how best on how best to respond to all these things that the Scottish nationalists will come up with and then when we've got it all together we'll publish it in a book if we get the funding for that. We've got lots of ideas for books, most of which are already written already. They just need to be brought together uh, to, to form the to form the library of British unionism. And um, yeah, why can't Scotland go it alone? Why can't Scotland be independent? Why can't we work together? Are you against us working together? Do you want us to hoard our wealth rather than share our wealth? All of these things, we are we have got the moral high ground here. And in our first article there on debunking myths, we point out the importance of maintaining the moral high ground on all of these matters. Because at the end of the day, the Scottish Nationalists are about separation. And once you once you quiz them on where they're where they're really coming from, then it's usually a bad place. It's usually a bad place. It's you know, with a bad heart, a lot of them unfortunately for them. But they can be redeemed, they can be redeemed and they can come over to to unionism, which has got it all going on for us, I have to say. Um, so coming up this week in British history, as you know, we love our British history because the past informs the present, which creates the future. And every day on our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram pages, we put out our on this day in order to recall to memory the things that have happened good bad or worse in british history um today the the memorial to queen victoria outside buckingham palace was unveiled um it was paid for by public subscription they raised so much money to build that memorial that they had enough left over to build Admiralty Arch at the other end of the mall 
on the 17th of May is the date in, seven, in 1977 when the Queen came to Glasgow uh, to begin her Silver Jubilee tour. And there's some one or two really nice pictures of her in a state coach with the Household Cavalry marching down Argyle Street. Check that out on the internet. And then in the evening, she went to uh, the King's Theatre to watch the somewhat unlikely trio of Dolly Parton, Sidney Devine and Frankie Howard entertaining her at the King's Theatre on the 17th of May, 1977. Lovely. Um, this year, uh, on 18th of May last year, there was a Maintain the Union march which was organised by uh, a, a group of people who called themselves British together. We didn't have anything to do with the organising of it. It was a very good march. It was the first time that unionists have had a political march for the union, and we counted them, as we always do. There was 1,383 on that march. And as you know, we have no interest in getting those figures wrong or out by any substantial extent, whether it's unionism or whether it is... Um, the Scottish Nationalists. Uh, 21st of May is the National Day of St Helena, where Britain imprisoned Napoleon, and which is still a British overseas territory to this day. On the 22nd of May, a very tragic and horrific thing, it was the uh, Lee Rigby was murdered horrifically on the 22nd of May. That memorial was coming up this week, which never forget that. And also on the 22nd of May, the British Loyalists began defending themselves against the American revolutionaries at, a, at what's called the Siege of Post-96, when 550 British Loyalists held out against over a 1,000 American revolutionaries and won the day at the end of the day, the Siege of Post-96. And we only knew about that because a reader sent us a copy of the Hotspur of 15th October 1966, which retold the story in cartoon form. Anyway, that's coming up this week. And if you want to know more about these sorts of things, please do check out our daily Facebook, our daily Instagram, our daily um, Twitter on UK A Force For Good. And please go to a forceforgood.uk forward slash support and put in your name and email if you like what we're saying. And if you think it needs to be, continue to be said, because without words, there can be no action and you get more of what you support. And if you don't support certain things, you get less of that. OK, so if you want more, please do support us because we're in this for the long term. We've got all the, the knowledge. We've got the ability to communicate it and we have got a great team. And I want to say a big thank you to the people behind Facebook at this moment to, right now to our people behind Twitter right now and to our people who will take this video and who will rip the audio form from it and put it on our podcast page, which is a forceforgood.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also find on Spotify, Spreaker, Podchaser and Deezer. Search for a Force for Good podcast. So thank you to them. Thank you to the person that's going to make it into a YouTube video and who's going to cut segments from this to post on Facebook and Twitter. We can't do this without you. This is a team effort. It's maybe me speaking to you here, but there's a team behind us. They are force for good team. And I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you to the folks, Stephen, Mary, Craig, Jamie, Stephen, waving back to you. We are here every Saturday at one o'clock. This is our Saturday street stall. And if you like it, go to forceforgood.uk forward slash support. Please put in your name. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an hour up. So that is the end of our Saturday street stall. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. And it just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom. And God save the Queen. Thank you.